started. Uh, my Faja is in Albuquerque at the network conference for the district. So you're stuck with me. <laughs> we on purpose didn't tell you guys that I was doing it. So you'd get here and you'd feel too awkward to leave. So <laughs> Matthew 14, 22 through 23, that's what we'll be looking at. Um, Matthew, yes, Matthew 14, 22 through 23 or 33. And it's a, it's a story about um, a storm. Well, Jesus' disciples are out on a, in, in a boat on a storm. And um, it, it's, it's, it's funny talking about stories like this because out here, out here in New Mexico, they're all like, how violent could the storm have been? <laughs> like, because we have puddles that, like, you know, when it's windy, the puddle will kind of wither. But, I mean, like, when out in places in the other places of the world, they actually have water. <laughs> and <laughs> those places get very stormy. Okay, so... 1422 says, immediately afterward, he compelled the disciples to get into the boat and to go ahead of him to the other side, while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray, but when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch in the night, he came to them walking on the sea, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter responded and said to him, Lord, it is you, command me to, I'm sorry, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened, and when he began to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out with his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, when I was a kid, I read this story, and I, and I used to think, well, I mean, I thought I was doing pretty good taking that step out of the boat, you know. Come on. <laughs> when they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are truly God's son. And so that, that we're going to look at we're going to look at the storms that come into life. Now, typically on on Wednesday nights, uh, Pastor does um, his going deeper, where he you know really goes in depth onto something. Because I won't be doing two weeks in a row next week, he'll be back. We're not going to be doing a going deeper tonight. We're just going to be looking at the at the idea of going through storms in life. So whenever we face things in our life, we always. Um, kind of tell ourselves these little lies to make ourselves feel better about it. The first lie that we tell ourselves is that nothing bad is going to happen to me, right? N nothing bad is going to happen. Um, this is more common the younger we are. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, sometimes we, we keep lying to ourselves as it gets older. But uh, in John 16, 33, Jesus says this. He says that in this life, there will be troubles. And I think that sometimes we kind of just forget that verse because I, I don't know why. We just... Whenever something bad happens, we are genuinely surprised. Like, God, how could you let this happen? Even though Jesus literally said, in this life, there will be troubles. And uh, so e even, even when they were in the boat, Peter still had problems, right? The storm was still there. Stepping out of the boat didn't make the problem, like, all of a sudden there. I mean, they were already in the problem. And it's the same thing for us. You know, we're, we're, we're going to go through str struggles, whether we, whether we use them as an opportunity to seek God or not, we are still going to face the troubles. The second lie that we tell ourselves, well, as long as I do what's right, everything will be fine. Okay, we, we are genuinely surprised when we do the right thing. We're the bigger person, right? So we, we forgive or we go the extra mile or, you know, we, we, we serve in ministry or we, I mean, whatever. We, we do whatever and we think that, hey, I've gone above and beyond, so surely nothing bad will happen. I'll give you a great example. Okay, so, uh, you know, I've been in ministry since I was 13 years old. So I've been in ministry for uh, 17 years, something like that. and. Uh, you know, so that in my book means that I have brownie points with God. I have bonus points. Okay. So there's like you peons, but then there's me, which is like super cool because I've been in ministry so long. So surely God will treat me with exception. Right. And uh, so then there's been a, quite a few struggles and, and problems that came up since I've been in ministry. And I, I, you know, hey, I'm still here. I'm still going strong. That means God, I mean, I've earned a lot of brownie points with God now. Well, much to my chagrin, I did, in fact, get sick with, like I said, I've told you guys this, I, I have colitis. And this is something that I didn't really want to happen. And the colonoscopy was definitely something I did not want to happen. But 
yet here we are. And one of the things that popped into my head was this just isn't fair, God, because I deserve better than this. I mean, I have the brownie points. I'm supposed to catch, you know, cash them in. And that's one of the things that really bothered me because I was praying to God, you know, before well, January, I guess, and saying, you know, about trying to set him straight about what was happening. God, you should just take this thing away and everything should just be fine because I don't know if you remember this, but I spent my whole life in ministry here. Yeah, you need to throw me a bone. I've earned it, you know, and then, you know, really trying to say all the right things and do whatever it's going to do, like, you know, trying to the puzzle pieces in alignment here so that we can get through this. And then um, I remember God speaking very, very clear and said, it's going to be okay. I'm going to be with you, but you're going to have to do this. I'm not taking away. It's just, it's, it's going to be something you have to go through. You're going to have to get the colonoscopy. And I was like, no, come on. Come on. Yeah. Well, actually I get to do them uh, on repetitive cycles every five years, buddy. Hey, if you want, I think we can get a group discount. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I bet he would really love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, too many. So, anyways, as long as I do what's right, everything will be fine. Then, you know, God's going to see this and he's just going to throw me a bone. Well, that's not exactly true. <laughs> um, in fact, in one part, Jesus is preaching. Um, in Matthew, it's called the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke, I don't know what it's called in Luke, but. Uh, he says this, and I'm actually gonna gonna read it to you. It's from Luke chapter six, and uh, it's it's also in Ma in Ma at the beginning of Matthew, like Matthew five or six or something. But um, the one I want to read is from Matthew, uh, Luke chapter six, verses twenty two, and then through twenty three. And this is just something once again that like we kind of come up with our own theology of what God should and shouldn't do in any given situation. Whereas in the Bible, he kind of says, like, no, this is actually what how things work. So this is one of those examples. Um, Luke chapter 6, verse 22 through 23. Blessed are you when, when uh, the people hate you and when they exclude you and insult you and scorn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. See, when I was betrayed, when I had rumors going about me, I was like, hold on, this is not this is not fair. And meanwhile, God's saying, no, you're blessed when that happens. It's like, well, I, it was a nice gift. It was thoughtful. Where's the receipt? And so verse 23, rejoice on that day and jump for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For their fathers used to treat the prophets the same way. The main point being, in being yes, do the right thing and suffer for it. And then rejoice for the suffering. And Peter says it a little bit differently. He says, don't be surprised when, when people persecute you as if some crazy thing is happening. Uh, it's actually better that you suffer for doing the right thing than that you do the wrong thing and then suffer. So then the third lie we tell ourselves, well, hey, you know what? In the end, it'll work out. I'm in a pickle now, but somehow between now and then, they just, I don't know. I, I don't know the middle story, but it's going to just work out. It'll be fine. But if you look at the Bible, we see examples like this. John the Baptist, right? He, he did what God called him to do. He was a shining example. And how did that story end? He died. The story ended with him dying. So in the end, it'll all work out. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> sometimes God has us go through uncomfortable things and sometimes even death. <laughs> like, so this is, once again, something that's not overly true. Um, now, I do want to say, you know, it did work out for the church. It did work out for God's plan. God's plan wasn't thwarted when John the Baptist died. But for John the Baptist himself, it didn't work out. He did, in fact, die. Um, so then the next, the next lie that we tell ourselves, well, if I do the formula, the problem will go away. The, what, what's the formula? The formula is like prayer. If I pray the right thing, if I go through all the right motions, if I'm religious enough, if I go to church enough, if I, you know, whatever that thing is, we always want like, okay, so I'm experiencing an, a negative symptom. I don't feel good. What is the thing that I have to do to make it not be bad anymore? A good example would be like a medical concern, right? Do you have a pain in your leg? You go to the doctor. Okay, what do I have to do to make this pain no longer in my leg? And then the doctor will tell you, we can cut it off. No, I'm just kidding. They, you know, they usually give you the little uh, things as to what to do. And we, we try to do the same thing with God, too. Like, okay, God, I'm going through an unpleasant event here. 
So surely you want me to be happy all the time and never go through anything unpleasant. So surely there's something that I can do to put into the machine and the machine will just pop out like fairy dust or whatever. And there's a few problems with that. First off, God's not a, ge not a genie. But then second off, God actually does a lot of working in us through those uncomfortable situations. So we have this idea that, hey, th things will change if you do everything right, but problems, problems don't just disappear all of a sudden. God can't be controlled. We, we can't expect for if we do all these like certain things that somehow it's just going to push all of God's buttons correctly, and so he's going to have to, you know, I, I, I fasted, God, so now you have to answer me. You know, like we, we put the quarter in the machine, now it has to, you know, give us the prize. But God, God can't be controlled like that. He can't be tamed. He, he, you don't get to just control God just because you did a certain thing. Like I did my part, God, now you do the part that I think you should do. Um, but something that Isaiah chapter 42, one through three says, is it says, I created you, I formed you. Don't, don't, don't fear, I, I am your God, I'm with you. And then he says this, when you go through the waters, I'm going to be with you. You're going to go through these, through these floods, and you're not going to drown. You're going to go through the fires, and you won't burn. You won't be burned up or consumed. So you, yes, it's going to be uncomfortable, it's going to be painful, but if you're asking where that was, uh, uh, Victoria, it was Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 3. Um, and so he talks about the way that, yes, you will have to go through those things, but I will be with you through the process. So he says something very similar in the beginning of Joshua. He says, okay, you go out and conquer the promised land, but you know, I'm going to be with you. Don't be afraid. And it's like, well... <laughs> There's one of those things where, okay, yeah, it's easier said than done, though, God. <laughs> Have you ever found yourself saying that where God says, hey, don't be afraid? And you're like, well, it's easy for you to say you're God. Um, so then the next thing, the next little lie that we tell ourselves, God doesn't love me if I struggle. If I experience something and I pray and he doesn't answer me or he answers me with the negatory good buddy, that must mean that, that God doesn't love me. And... The truth is actually um, way far from that. First off, he said the last thing he says in the Gospel of Matthew before the end, the book ends. He says, okay, go out, make disciples of all nations. But the very last thing that he says in Matthew 28, verse 20, is he says this. He says, and I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you always. So, oh, but I'm going through this struggle. I don't, I am with you always. He said, in this life, there's going to be troubles. And then we go through troubles, and we say, this isn't fair, God. Why are you having this? And then he says, well, I'm with you. And so he said, well, well, if you're really with me, you take away all the struggles. And it's like, well, that's not what I said at all. But it's what we feel when we're in the struggle. And we allow that feeling to take a greater dominance than what God has said. See, because I feel it is unfair. Therefore, it is unfair. And meanwhile, it's like, well, <laughs> no, 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 no. Our feelings don't get to just decide what is what God should do. Um, and then also there's this idea that, okay, God doesn't love me if I struggle. Does that make sense? If I'm going through a problem, does, does that really mean that God doesn't love me? Let's think about this. God died for me. So clearly he does love me. So that means whatever the misunderstanding is that's going on in my brain, it doesn't mean that God doesn't love me. It just means I'm not quite getting it. The next little lie that we tell ourselves what if so and so happens? We just sit there and we let our we let our minds go crazy, right? Well, surely I can stop it from happening. I can think out every possible thing that could happen, and I can just work it through and just use my brain enough to to to, to stop that from happening. I, I can do whatever or foresee all the problems, and surely there's some way that I can just stop the problem from happening. Well, the problem with that is that we aren't in control. God is in control. And in our lives, we like to feel like we're in control. And a lot of people even have anxiety about this, you know, all the time because they're, well, I just don't feel like I'm in control. And it's, yeah, you aren't in control. And so we try and do these little things to like lie to ourselves, like, no, we're, we're in control. It'll be okay. And it just doesn't really work out like that because we're not in control. 
the, the truth of it is, if it happens, it happens. There's nothing you can do to change it from happening. Nothing. So why bother worrying about it? In fact, Jesus said something. He said this. Which of you, by worrying, can add a single moment to your life? And think about that. Okay, so I've got this problem or, or potentially a problem that's coming up. And I'm going to worry about it. How is that going to help us feel any better? But yet we're scared to let it go. Because if I don't worry about it, who will? If I don't worry about it, what happens if that happens? As though somehow by worrying about it, we hold on to a bit of our control. It's the only thing I can control, by golly, so I'm going to worry to death. Well, you know, it's not going to change anything. It's just going to make you less happy. Isaiah 51 says something that I think was, was, worth, was worth reading for this uh, part here. Isaiah chapter 51, verse uh, 12 through 13. It says, I... I myself am he who, can, who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of mortal man and of a son of man who is made like grass, that you have forgotten the Lord your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, that you fear continually all day long because of the fury of the oppressor, as, as he makes ready to destroy? And where is the rage of the oppressor? And the part that I really want to focus on in this verse is this part right here where it says, I, I myself am he who comforts you, and then skip down. You have forgotten the Lord your maker who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. You fear continually all day long. And I think that that's just such a, such a, such a, it really relates to, to what we're talking about here. We forget, oh, but God, this is, this is this big thing. And he's saying, at the same time, he's saying, well, now hold on. And I'll, I'll read that part again because it's easy to miss. Um. I am the one who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. But God, this is so big. This is so scary. I'm not in control. I don't know. I don't know what to do. I laid the foundations of the earth. So it's like, well, I think that maybe we're getting our, our attention on the wrong, the wrong part of the story. Uh, the, the, next, uh, the next little lie that we tell ourselves, which, which is a variation of one of the other ones, but um, God owes me. I, I, I'm a good person, so God owes it to me. There's, you know, basically it's unfair and unjust for God to treat me like he did. And, uh, you know, then we even really genuinely get mad at God. Like, this was this was not fair. You didn't handle the situation correctly. And, you know, God, it, it, you know, it's, it's your name on the line. You know, you're the one who's acting, you know, unjustly. You, you're allowing me to be persecuted here. Well, let's look at two verses that I think really relate to that lie that we tell ourselves. The first one is Job 41, 11, and it says this, who has been first to give to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the entire heaven is mine. And another way that that could be translated is who has existed first before me that I should repay him? In other words, I'm from eternity. Who has a one up on me? And it's like, well, that that, that's a good point. That, that is a good point. Especially when you start stop taking things for granted and start thinking, okay, so I have breath in my lungs because, well, God. I'm alive because, well, again, God. I have come to be saved by God, and then I, that salvation is by God. And so you start reaching all these things of, you know, I, I, I'm so far in the negative here that I don't actually have a one-up on God on this one. Uh, so then Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10 says this. For God is not unjust, so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name. God is not unjust to forget what you have done. So, you know, yes, you know, it feels like maybe in the storm, when you're in the middle of the storm, like Peter was on that boat, you know, eesh, this, we, we go through these things. Well, nothing bad's going to happen. Well, I'm in the middle of a storm, so something bad is happening. Well, oh, surely if I do the right thing. Well, in the end, it'll work out. All these different th lies that we tell ourselves. And uh, no, we are going to go through storms. And it's not always going to be fair. We, we aren't always going to know what's going on or what good's going to come from it. We have no idea about any of that. And uh, but throughout that, we know that God is with us. We know that God is not unjust. 
So uh, when we do go through those storms, and we'll come back to the story in Matthew, but just roll with me on this. When we do go through the storms, we do typically we do one of these four things. The first thing we try to do when we are facing a storm, uh, and, and the storm is, is those things that you go through in life. It can be the death of a loved one. It can be um, somebody betraying you or, or, or letting you down. It can be losing a job or going through a financial difficulty. Can, I mean, it can be anything. You know the storms in your life. It, I don't have to keep giving you examples. You know when you're in the middle of a storm. When we are in those storms, one of, the one of the first things we try to do is we try to stop the storm. We try to be in control. So ima imagine you're one of the disciples in the boat. It's not working. You know, it's, 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 that, it's that vain attempt that we have to somehow assert our dominance over the situation. And we try and, we try and treat our, our problems in life as though they were a rabid, not a rabid, but, but, a, but a dog. Like we are cycling or something and there's a dog. You know, you plant your legs apart and you say, no. And the dog's going to be like, okay, bro, calm down. And then walk away. But that's not really how our struggles go. And it's as vain as trying to stop the wind by blowing into the wind. Or when it's raining, trying to just stop it and put it back up in the clouds. You just can't. It's, it's not possible. But it's one of those things we try to do because we don't want to admit that we're not in control. And, and the funny thing is, the more we try and tell ourselves that we are in control, the more we're, are, we're going to be anxious about it because we're still trying to maintain control. It's like if you ever had a panic attack, right? You sit there and try to fight it or try to run or whatever, but if you just stop and let it happen, and it'll just run its course and you're fine. You know, it's totally different. Um, so some of the things that we try to do to stop the storm, we, we try to pray the right prayer. If, I, if, I, if I'm holy enough, if I'm righteous enough, if I say the right words, you know, everything will just go back to normal. Or we try to conjure up our own power, right? Like, I have it within myself. You know, if I, you know, ooh, I awaken my inner power. Eagle powers, come to me. And it doesn't work. Uh, so then the second thing uh, that we try to do in storms is we try to turn the boat around. Uh, the exa uh, what do you mean? What I mean by that? We try to get out. Um, let me give you some examples. Uh, it, let's say you're married and you're tired of dealing with a divorce. Let's say you. Um, I lost my place here. Let's say uh, you you're you're in a you're in a ministry and you don't like it. Quitting. Let's say you're facing life and you're tired of the struggles. Suicide. Whatever it is, trying to turn the boat around. Trying to trying to just. Find the quickest way out of the storm because our brain tells us, hey, ow, pain, discomfort, get off as fast as you can. And so we say, okay, brain, you and me, we got this. And so we try to run crazy and it, it doesn't, doesn't really work like that. We can't just stop the storm. We can't just push the, push the pause button as, as, as well as that would be. There's been a few times in life where I was like, if it was just like a video game, would you just pause the game and then you could just kind of catch your breath a little bit and be like, okay. Let's think about this rationally. How am I going to deal with this? Life doesn't let us do that. The third thing we try to do in storms, we try to hide in the boat. We try to hide in the boat. This is where we're just scared to do something. We just kind of draw a blank. We just surely doing nothing is a good option. And uh, Maybe we pretend like it's okay or just ignore the problem. Like it's 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 fine. I'm totally okay with the with the houses burning down around me. It's okay. You know, I'm just it's fine. There's there's no problem here. And it's like, well, uh, there is. You're in a burning house. And it's like, no, it's fine. Really, it's fine. Um, the good example of this would be um, uh, there. <laughs> I hope he's okay with me telling this story. But if if he's not, there's nothing he can do because he's not here. One time, Ben was. Uh, <laughs> was uh if i remember the story correctly they were they were playing by the campfire and there was, <laughs> there was a soda can <laughs> that was in the fire so chuck chuck moved to the side and said hey ben, <laughs> hey ben pick that up and so ben goes to touch it and he burns his hand and so then he's afraid that he's going to get in trouble for burning his hand <laughs> so we <laughs> Okay, he's afraid that he's gonna get in trouble for burning his hand. So, 
So on the way home, he's all, Mom, can I have a juice? And my, yeah, sure, Benny. <laughs> and he, he's all putting it on his hand. Oh. Hey, Mom, can I have another juice? <laughs> sure, Ben. <laughs> oh. Hey, Mom, can I have another? What are you doing with all the juices? <laughs> I burned my hand. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, anyways, we laughed, we cried, it moved us. Um, oh, my goodness. Uh, trying to hide from the problem. Like, oh, no, it's not going to affect me. It's fine. You know, I can just ignore the problem. It'll go away, and everything will just kind of work out. Well, obviously, we see that none of these three options really resolve things. And that's, that's the fourth option. And uh, I want to point something out. You know, the disciples are in the boat. All the disciples are in the boat. But the only guy that figured out that there was another option for him was Peter. The only one out of 12 who figured this out. All the other ones thought, the only option I have is to be scared in the storm. That's it. I can cower in this boat, and, and that's my only option. Well, Peter, uh, I know a lot of people make fun of Peter, but Peter, he's the only guy who comes up with, with solution number four. Stepping out of the boat. And this would be, another way of saying this would be moving forward. You can't control the problems. You can't control that you're in the middle of the street. You can't control any of that. But Peter had a solution. Move forward. He didn't know what that meant. Why do you want to get out of the boat, Peter? Well, I don't know. What am I going to do? Just sit here with these guys? <laughs> you know, I, I don't even know if he really thought this one through. But he, at least he realized that there was a fourth option. We can move forward in a storm. Now, that's difficult because we don't have any guarantee that the storm is going to stop. There's none. No guarantee. I remember when my son died, I, I, I was just heartbroken. How am I ever going to move past this? You know, it is never going to, you, you can't, you can't. But I, I do remember deciding, you know, if I don't remember him and take the time to grieve for him, nobody else will. Nobody else really remember his name. So I felt like I couldn't move on. You know what I mean? Kind of like I had to just keep hurting perpetually. But I remember when I came to the day and thought, you know, I don't have to pretend like he never existed. I don't have to say I'm going to be fine. But there's still more life. You know what I mean? I remember taking that step of I'm going to move forward. And that's what we find Peter doing. He's in the middle of the storm. Things aren't going so well. God, Jesus isn't with us. That was our safety ticket. I know that, you know, hey, you know, if he's with us, he can do these things. I mean, he just fed like 5,000 people. But that was then. This is now. He's not with us. There's a freak storm here. What the frick are we going to do? And meanwhile, Jesus comes walking in the storm and they're like, holy crap, it's a ghost. And so then that ghost turns out to be Jesus. And like, oh, well, that was a bullet dodged. And, uh, and uh, as they're in the middle of this, there's their hope. And Peter is the only one that has the brains to say, hey, maybe if I get closer to that guy, maybe things will be better. I don't know exactly what that entails, but hey, I can walk out of this boat, you know, if you'll give me some encouragement in the matter. So sometimes, though, when we move forward, we, do, we try to do it without trusting God. We try to, like we're, like, we're embarrassed to fail. So we try to show our independence to God, right? Like, God, and, and then when, when, we, when, we break, when we break and we come to God and we say, I just can't do it, God, I, I, I failed and all this stuff. And then meanwhile, God's like saying, what, what are you even talking about? I didn't say you had to be independent of me. I said I wanted you to depend on me. Well, I wanted to be able to work through the situation and to, and to why? So that, that's more of our hang-up than God's. Sometimes we try to find the power in ourselves, and it just never works. But, you know, the thing about this is, and I think Peter shows us this when he steps out of the boat. Just kind of, I'll, I'll read this part again, okay? So I'll start in verse 24. The boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, 
he came to them walking on the sea. I'm sorry, the fourth watch of the night. He came to them walking in, on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Ah! But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter responded and said to him, now keep in mind, Peter is the only one who has the guts to say anything. Remember this, okay? Peter responded and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. You know, that's exactly the, the kind of a trick that a ghost would do. Oh, yeah, I'm Jesus. Come here so I can eat you and suck your soul, right? Like, yet Peter, he just, I mean, why did you even need Jesus to say something if you were that trusting? Why didn't you just walk out of the boat? And Anyways, so Peter responded and said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you in the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. The only one out of 11 who came, who came up with the, or out of 12, who came up with the idea of, hey, I can get closer to Jesus and maybe that'll do something. Blows me away. So the, that was pretty cool, stepping out of a boat, trusting Jesus that much. But here's something that Peter shows us, that getting out of the boat isn't necessarily the hard part. walking on water is that's the day-to-day -day, okay it's easy to take that big step for god right i'm going to do this big thing for god okay fine so you do whatever it is that that big thing is for you for some of us it's getting saved or going into ministry or whatever i mean you take that big step and oh man i've done great that soon becomes the easy part and the living in it becomes the hard part the day-to-day -day of trusting in god through the storm it's a lot easier to step out of the boat than it is to keep walking realizing I'm not having any failsafe around me. I no longer have that boat. It's the only comfort and safety I had. I no longer have it. It's harder to walk day by day with that. I mean, it's easier to just say, hey, one and done. You know, I blew God away with my level of faith. It's a lot harder to walk in the day by day. Oh, God, this is, this is getting real difficult. This is getting really hard. So to take a big step doesn't really require that much endurance. Just kind of that quick moment to do it. You know, like when you were teenagers and you were like, I'm just going to go for it and kiss the girl. You know, it's just, it was a, it was a sudden thing. It wasn't that hard. You know, it, it's one of those things you had butterflies and then it was done. But it, it, that wasn't, that was just a moment in time. See, it was the, it was a lot difficult to do beyond that. So some good examples of that would be, you know, giving your life to Christ. When you say, I do, and, and when, you, when, you, when you're getting married and you say, I do, it's really easy to say, I do, in, in a marriage. I mean, in a wedding. Really easy. Just two words. I do. Another good example would be uh, joining ministry. It's easy to say, hey, I'll do that ministry. I mean, that's really easy. But when it, sticking with it is really the, what's hard. When... When you're not, you're, when you're beyond giving your life to Christ and you're in the process of following Christ, that painful process of every single day trusting God as you're going through these pitfalls of life, when those bad things do happen, instead of going to God and, and taking it out on him, going to God and trusting him through it, when after you've said I do, you have to wake up with the same person day after day and they put up with your crap and you put up with their crap, it's a lot different than saying I do. That's a lot different. When you're in ministry and you're beyond just that first like honeymoon phase of that ministry and you get into the part where somebody's like literally talking down to you and making fun of you the whole time that you're trying to serve them. You're just like, I'm just trying to love you. If you just shut up and let me love you. Have you ever had that happen to you? No. I mean, come on. When, when, I mean, it happens itself all the time. Like you're all, I'm giving you food. Okay. You should be nice to me at least until the box is out of my hands. Golly, span it out there, buddy. I'm giving up my time to give you food. Calm down. But anyways, it's a lot easier to sign up for ministry than it is to keep doing it when you're loving and serving people that are unlovable, when they're just not nice people. It's not getting out of the boat that's hard. It's the walking, the day-to-day. So there's some things that happen in the storm. The first thing that happens is it kills our joy. The storm kills our joy. I'm sorry that, that I didn't um, make the font larger than that, guys. Uh, I just forgot. 
So anyways, the first thing that happens when we're in a storm is it kills our joy. We, 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 we lose that sense of wonder that we had. You know, when we first get saved and we're just like, anything is possible. God can do all these wonderful things. And then he does and he lets you down or whatever. And, you know, the years go on and unanswered prayers and you get a little bit more bitter and a little bit more bitter, a little bit more edgy. And you're just like, why even pray? God will never answer me anyways. You know, and you just get to a point of like, you still believe in God. You just don't necessarily believe God. You know what I mean? Because you think, well, he's just not as good as he said that he, I didn't read the fine print. You know, I misunderstood the situation. And uh, so it kind of kills that sense of wonder, kills the joy. We look at the storm and we're like, this is just the, all that there is now. There's just a storm. That's just it. And we, another thing that happens when it kills the joy is we forget the good that happened. Jesus literally just fed 5,000 people just like right over here. But we're not, we're not talking about that right now. We're talking about the way that I'm in a storm now, though. That was then. This is, this is now. It's a lot scarier then. And it kills our joy. Well, I'd be a lot happier serving you, God, if you take the storm away. Meanwhile, the truth is, how, how much can you really choose to trust God when there is no storm? The next thing that happens in the storm, we, it robs us of our thankfulness. If we allow it, it doesn't have to, but this is just one of those things. See, how many of the disciples said, hey, thank you for the boat in the middle of the storm, God? None of them. They were all saying, ah, oh, we're going to die. There's a ghost, too. The lake's haunted now. I mean, the boat's haunted. We're haunted. The, I don't know. It's, it's a, that's pretty much all they were doing. There was no thank you for the boat. Uh, another thing, you didn't hear them saying things like, hey, thank you for the storm. And you might say, thank you for the storm. What, are you crazy? Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, or how about this? Thank you for, for God's presence. Because remember that God still, before Jesus, God had still promised that he was with them. Okay? So, I mean, that's kind of an important step in the process. They didn't say, hey, thank you, God, that we're still alive. We haven't died yet. This storm is so freaking scary that I've forgotten that I'm not dead yet. Have you ever done that? Forgot that you were still alive? <laughs> you go through a problem and it's so overwhelming that you forget, oh, wait. In my head, I'm making it a lot worse than it is, but I'm still here. I mean, it's painful. It hurts. I wish I wasn't here, but I am still here. Storms rob us of our thankfulness. There was no, hey, thank you, God, for providing for me. Some ways we do this is, is uh, we turn a blessing from God into a curse. Like, for instance, God gives us a job, and instead of saying, God, thank you that I have a job. Thank you that I have some way of paying my bills. I, I don't really like this job, but hey, thank you that I have a way of paying my bills. Instead of doing that, we turn it into a curse. I hate my job. My boss is an idiot. They don't pay me enough. And I'm not disagreeing with you on all those things. I, I, I understand it's hard out there. But sometimes we overlook the good things that God has done because it's a storm that we wish we didn't have to go through. Well, I wish I didn't have to work at this job. Well, if that's the only job you can get, there's not much you can do. He didn't abandon us, and he, and he won't. The third thing that happens in the storm, the storm distracts us. And I can just imagine Peter saying, he steps out of the boat, he's walking, he's like, hold on a second. Why am I out of the boat? What's my game plan here? Where am I going? When we're in the middle of a storm, we lose sight of where we're going. We don't, we don't know our purpose. We don't know what, what, what are we heading towards. I don't know. I'm just trying to get through the day and survive. And I think that Peter was probably in a similar situation. He, but seeing the wind, he became frightened. And when he began to sink, he's like, oh, this is not good. I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to be going down. So he cried out, Lord, save me. I don't know what's going on, but things are not good. That I just realized where I am. It's like when you wake up in a daze and you're like, ah, oh, I had such a, oh, I'm still here. And those kids are going to be waking up in a minute. Just kidding. Joking. Joking. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, the storm distracts us. The last thing that I wanted to mention about the storms, they test us. And this is a necessary part of life. All of us want to go through life without troubles. It's not going to happen. It's not even, that's not even the main, the main point either. The, when we're in the middle of a storm, it tests our motives. We, we go into a thing and we say, you know what? I'm a really noble person. I just really, I'm good. I, I'm just, I'm good. And then we go through troubles. 
and it shows us our heart and it helps some of that ugliness come to the top I'll give you an example my my second daughter is adopted and there's this idea when you when you adopt someone you don't intend for it to be there and i thought man no you know nothing's gonna, nothing wrong is going to happen well they did wrong things did go wrong or thing, things did go wrong and another thing you think is i'm doing this for good motives another thing you think is i'm really good for doing this and for having such a good attitude for doing i'm just great all around she's lucky to have me as a father so then you know after this kind of wears off you start to realize that maybe your motives weren't all that pure and i'll give you a good example there's somewhere in the back of your head that says well, I did her a favor, so she should feel indebted to me. So that when I ask her to do something, she should do it without giving me any sass. How many kids do you know that do that? By a show of hands. <laughs> they don't do that. All kids do that. See, and there was that little bit of entitlement. I'm entitled for this child to always do everything that I want them to do because I did them a favor. I bailed them out. See? You see that? Now, did I realize that that was in my heart? No. But the storm revealed, it tested my heart, and it showed what was actually there. I thought I had good motives. Maybe I don't trust like I thought. Oh, God, I trust you so much. I believe in you, all these different stuff. Okay, well, here's a storm. Oh, you know, I'm having a hard time. I wouldn't have such a hard time trusting you if I wasn't in the storm. And God's saying, this is how you get faith built. And keep in mind that one of our main purposes in life should always be to grow our faith. We grow our faith through the storms. Peter never had an opportunity to ask to step out of the boat until the storm was there for him to step out of the boat. You understand? We can't choose to have faith that there's no opportunity for faith. So let's wrap, some, wrap things up here. So God brings by these storms to bring us to a deeper level of trust. I was watering my, my plants the other day, and I was holding the hose because the hose didn't quite reach. I was doing that little thing with the, you know, the thumb where the cold water freezes your thumb, and you can't even feel it anymore. And you're like, am I even squeezing anymore? I don't, I don't know. I mean, you just keep doing it, and you're like, well, I guess I'm going to do it. It's working so far. And you just... <sighs> so I'm trying to do it. And I'm watching this, this bottom branch of this, of this tree, and it's going like this. And I was thinking... You know, a lot of the things that I have to do is very, are very scary, but this isn't very scary. But on that branch going like this was a little bug. And so I thought, and I realized for a minute, that for that bug, watering the tree was very scary because his whole world was shaking up and down. And then I, I had a little bit of a revelation, ah, you know, light bulb moment and everything. <laughs> right? No, that's not the revelation that I had. The revelation that I had was that I started thinking, you know, it's scary for me because of my perspective. I'm like the bug on the, on the, on the branch. There's nothing scary. No, nothing scary is happening right now. I'm scared because I'm that bug on the branch. Meanwhile, if I had God's perspective of the whole thing that was going on, it's not as bad as I'm making it out to be up here. And that's kind of what happens when we go through storms in life. For us, it, the whole, whole world is shaking, but in reality, it's just a, just a little twitter of a branch i mean it's, it's nothing because god never lost control and we say but what if the situation kills me god will carry us even through death the bible promises that he doesn't promise that we'll never die <laughs> come on <laughs> you can't hold that against god so uh, you know living with colitis is is hard but christ is here he's with me through the struggle it's it's hard to have chronic pain to have chronic health issues that's that's hard and there's lots of people who I know in this very church who go through much worse than I have it. I just have days of pain just every once in a while. There's people like Lauren, for instance, who's, who has occasional days of not having pain. I mean, things could be a lot worse for me. And no matter what the struggle, if we fix our eyes on Christ, he will meet us there. He'll meet us in that storm. Do you, do you think it's coincidence that Jesus showed up right when the disciples needed him in the storm? 
Do you think that's coincidence? How many times in life do we go through life like that? We're in the storm. It's very scary. Oh, look, it just so happens that you have the means to do this, or you have the counselor that'll talk you through this, or you have the, the medicine that'll get you through this. Or you, see what I mean? It's just like, oh, it just so happened to work out. And it's like, well, who do you think is working that out, though? And so here's the big idea that I want you to get from this. Yes, there is a struggle. For me, it's colitis. For you, it's something else. But Christ is there. You still have the struggle. For me, I still have the struggle in my body. It's very frustrating some days. Not every day, but some days. I still have the struggle. Oh, sorry. I still have the struggle in my mind. Trying to maintain the right outlook, trying to not let it, let things get me down. I still have the struggle in my emotions, trying to not let depression and anxiety win. But Christ is still with me. Well, if Christ is with me, I shouldn't have to go through that. Well, who, who told you that? You're going to go through problems. Jesus said in this life there will be struggles. That's the way of it. You can complain or not like it. Okay, that's an option for you, but it's not going to change anything. So in life, you can come to one or two, con two conclusions, and I've summed them up with two statements. Number one, you can either blame him for the storm or thank him for getting you through it. And oftentimes in life, you're going to find yourself wavering between the two, and that's okay. It's all right. Okay, really, it's, all, it's okay. God doesn't expect a, perf a perfect performance. He expects through the struggle for you to lean into him. That's, that's really what he asked for is our heart. And the second statement that I can summarize this in, in you can choose to either curse him for the bad days or trust him through the bad days. You still have to go through the bad days. It's just you can blame God for it and you get all angry with him, or you can, you can trust him that he'll get you through the process. And I think that that's kind of what I got out of this story going, dealing with the issues that I've been going through. And uh, so, okay, Lord, thank you for this day, and thank you for all the things you've, you've uh, been working through as Lord. Help us, help us to, to notice more of how, you, how wonderfully you've been working in our lives and the things that we just take for granted. You know, all, all, the, all the prayers that you've answered and, and the things that you bless us with and, and, and situations that, that, that could have been so much worse that we just never said thank you for. We never even noticed. Lord, help us to be thankful in our heart, even in the middle of the storm. Because even when a storm does surround us, we, we still have the boat. We still have you. So Lord, I pray that you would bless us as we go throughout the, throughout the week and, and be with us. Help us to help us to work through our fears and, 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 to, and to trust you through the storms. And uh, Lord, that you would help us, help us uh, go through the weeks uh, with strength. We love you, Lord. Amen.